Okay, we're back, and today we're going to be talking about math.random. We've been talking a lot about static, um, and here we have a static method coming in, which is why it's fitting in right here. So we in CSP learned the random class. However, that's not part of the AP Computer Science A subset. That's fine. I teach you a lot of things that aren't part of the subset. Random is part of the subset, meaning you will see at least multiple choice questions involving random. And um, so you got to be prepared in order to work with that. I'm going to teach you random. And from this point on, when we go to generate a random number, we're going to use this to do it. Okay. Instead of the math, um, I'm sorry, instead the math method random will be used to generate random numbers. Just looking at this method signature, here's what I know. This is coming out of the math class. The name of the method is random. It doesn't take in any explicit parameters. It doesn't take in any implicit parameters. That's because it's static, right? This underline indicates that it is static, meaning we'll never create a math object. There'll never be an implicit parameter. And based on what we see here, there's no explicit parameters. But whenever you call it, what it's going to do is return a double. Recall that the math class is part of the Java default library. That is java.lang, right? There's this massive library. It's things like string are found in java.lang. And anything that's in this uh, effectively directory, folder, library, they're already part of Java. They're already there. You don't need to import it. Okay, so we've been using math this entire time without importing it. It's part of java.lang. When called, random will return a random double in the range 0, 0.0 to 1.0. Cool, right? This means inclusive. This means exclusive. So 0, 0.0 is a possibility. One itself, never a possibility. We'll never actually hit one. Okay, let me just show you that real fast. And what I have here is um, IntelliJ already brought up. I'm going to just kind of switch projects or do a new project real fast. I really just want something to test in. I don't need to switch folders. I'm going to create just a little test project real fast. You can just watch. Okay, I'm going to plug in a main method. Too fast. There we go. Um, and what I want to show you is this math.random method. Right? No explicit parameters here. I didn't actually create a math object. Random is static. And IntelliJ is actually italicizing it, trying to indicate that it is static. That is going to give me a random number in the range 0 to 0 point, or to 1.0, inclusive, exclusive. What do I mean? 0, 0.0 is inclusive, and 1.0 is exclusive. I'm going to run it one time. We'll take a look. Okay, and I get, I get this number right here. It is in that number range. Okay, uh, let's run it like several times, right? I'm just gonna create a quick loop in IntelliJ. My shortcut syntax for that is for i, and it's going to create this header. And I wanna do about 30 iterations. The reason being 30 is like statistically um, the minimum Right. In my statistics class, that's what I learned, that you need to do about 30 samples. There's even about 30 samples in your, um, your stuff before it becomes statistically relevant. Okay, I'm going to tell it to run. And we see the numbers that we're getting. Right. Oh, we got close to 0 0.0000. Never actually won itself. And I mean, I can run this thing 300 times and we get a really good idea of the numbers that are possible with math.random. Okay, that's kind of cool, but you know, I need numbers in the range like one to 10. So the question then becomes, how in the world do we do this? It's sneaky, I hate that. Okay, so there's some techniques you can use in addition to math.random to get all of the possibilities that you want. For one thing, you can broaden the range of random by multiplying by a number, okay? So if I take math.random and I multiply the result, like multiplying by 10, I think a lot of people understand this quite quickly, is effectively just 
uh, moving the decimal one spot, right? Let's kind of demonstrate that. So if I take the result that gets returned here and multiply by 10, all of a sudden my number range is a lot bigger, right? We actually have whole numbers involved there. I'm still in 300, maybe that's a bit much, right? I got whole numbers here um, with this fractional part, right? I actually got something in front of the decimal, okay? So this can broaden the range. The way that I like to think about this is, uh, actually, we'll come back to that. You can then shift the range, right? So multiplying broadens the range. Like keep in mind, notice that our low end number stays the same, right? 0, 0.0 is still a possibility, but I can broaden the range, right? If this is the current range, I can shift it a little bit further by multiplying. Um, the range can then be shifted by adding or subtracting a number. Okay, so here's, let's think about this as your initial range. If you multiply, you're gonna broaden the range. If you add, you shift the range. If you subtract, you shift it the other way. And so with those two techniques combined, you can basically um, kind of help mold the number the way that you want. The problem I hope you're seeing, even with our own output here, is, th this, is, this, is still, this is still a double. Right. If I want the number range like one to 10, what do you got to do? That's where casting comes in. Okay. Random whole numbers can be achieved via casting. So all these techniques combined, right? Multiplying broadens the range, adding or subtracting shifts the range. And if I want to make these things whole numbers, I can use casting. Okay, let's try that. Uh, this one here, the number range that says it's it's one to 10. So I'm gonna multiply by nine and add one to shift it. If I just multiply by nine, but we cast that result, why don't we take a look at that? So I'm gonna cast this thing. Right, I'm gonna cast this and see what my number range looks like and then we'll, we'll edit our comment. I'm seeing the two. I see zero as a possibility. I saw one down below while like the very last iteration. I don't see a nine. Okay, so our number range is effectively zero to nine. What I'd like you to think about is that the moment that we bring in casting, right? That, that means we're going to be getting whole numbers. You see that. What multiplying becomes at that point is number of possibilities. In this number range, I have nine possibilities. We got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's it, right? Nine itself wasn't an actual possibility. So that's what multiplying effectively does. If I do times four, maybe this comes a little bit more apparent because our number range is a little bit smaller. I'm still doing 30 iterations. We see zero is a possibility. One, two, three, that's it. No actual fours. Okay, so the moment that you bring casting in, right, we're, we're gonna get whole numbers. What this does, it broadens the range, yeah, right? Zero is still a possibility. But I like to think about this as whenever you multiply, that is number of possibilities, right? In this particular number range, there are four possibilities. Zero, one, two, and three, okay? Now, our shifting can still be achieved by adding or subtracting, right? Maybe I don't want a one in my output. I'm sorry, maybe I don't want a zero in my output. Like I want the numbers um, one through four here. Well, we can take that, we can add one, and that is effectively broadening and then shifting. Okay, so I'm gonna run it again. Notice I'm not getting zeros, but I am getting a four. My new number range, I should probably take out the doubles, is effectively one to four. Within this, there are four possibilities. One, two, three, and four. But that range has been shifted so that zero is not one of those possibilities, and four is. So. Using these techniques, you can get what you want out of math.random. 
And I know that's going to seem annoying to you at first after using the random class. This is, however, in the subset. You need to learn it. And from what I've experienced, most programming languages actually handle it this way. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, let's code die. Write a class die. This is the singular of dice, by the way. Um, here we're trying to get back into object-oriented programming a little bit. Right? We learned a lot about static. We've been, we've been doing our stint on static. That's what brought random to us. However, none of this is static. Right? These are constructors. How do I know? Well, there's no return type. And here I can see the class name and I can see that these things match the class name. So we can create here kind of a die. This one's going to be your uh, typical six-sided die that everyone's used to. Here, this one's going to take in an integer, which would be our number of sides. Right? So we can uh, do different dies. And then once I have that dice object, I can tell it to roll. And what I, I like you to recognize is that the object orientation makes sense here. When it comes to math, what is a math object? When it comes to a die, a singular of dice, uh, yeah, that's an actual object in the real world that I can pick up. It's got a very important property number of sides, and I can tell it to roll. I can make it perform that action. So let's make this. You can code along with me if you would like. I'm in IntelliJ. I'm going to do a new Java class project by going to File, New Project. We'll go Next, Next, and Die. Okay, I'm going to expand my project folder, right click on the SRC, do a new Java class called Die. All right, let's take a look. As always, when we're making these new classes, especially ones that are used to model objects. I'm going to ask you what kind of instance variables we got. Most importantly, number of sides. None of the stuff here is static, meaning we will be making these objects. Objects have properties. A particular property I'm interested in is private int sides. Okay. Um, I'm ready for a constructor, right? We got public die. And what I want to do is I want this guy to make the typical six-sided die constructs a six-sided die. All I'm going to do here is initialize sides, right? There's no explicit parameter coming in, so I'm going to have to effectively hard code a value. I'm going to give it a value, but i like you to recognize that this kind of makes sense, right? This is, if you're like doing a game, a board game in particular, this is the die that gets used by far the most often, okay? Why don't we go ahead and um, do our roll method? You know, this constructor is easy enough. We got public die, and this particular one's going to take in an integer, which I'm going to call sides. So this explicit parameter is coming in. I'm going to use it to initialize my instance variable. It has the same name as my instance variable, right? You can do that. This local parameter has the same name as a instance um, variable. So we're going to use this dot notation in order to differentiate. I'm going to save the local variable into the instance variable. And that's it. This will allow me to construct a die with um, whatever, however many sides I want, which by the way, we could technically do like um, a three-sided die or a one-sided die. Um, mm, mm, whatever. Let's do our roll method. We got public int, no static, right? In order for me to use this roll method, I have to have a die object in advance. So roll, I want it to roll the die. We get the result out of that. So, hmm, I need to return an integer. We're going to use math.random, right? If I just did this, it's going to be mad at me, right? Math.random gives you a double every single time in the range. 0.0 to 1.0 inclusive exclusive all right so this just doesn't work okay so we need to cast it all right that at least satisfies my syntax because now what i'm producing is a integer every single time the question is now number of possibilities right if i'm rolling this die how many possibilities do i have well it's six it's whatever is in number of sides. Okay. 
Um, let's try this out. Look at some of the results. I think some of you right away um, are going to recognize if I, let's just go ahead and take care of it, right? Multiplication, this is number of possibilities. But what are those possibilities? Zero is still a possibility. One, two, three, four, and five. So I'd like you to recognize that I'm getting six possibilities. Zero is one of them, and that doesn't make sense. And I'm not getting a six. So as it stands right now, this is my number range, right? Multiplying by sides, assuming that we're using this constructor. Multiplying by sides is gonna give me zero up to six, but not actually six itself. So what I wanna do is shift that range just by one. The moment that we add one, what we're getting, and really I should take these off because we are doing an integer, right? The moment that I multiply by, or sorry, add one, we're gonna shift that range. One is now my lowest possibility. And we're gonna go up to seven. If you wanna rewrite this to be inclusive on both ends, it's perfectly fine, right? Once I add one, that's gonna shift by range. I still have six possibility in this range. One, two, three, four, five, and six. One is my lowest possibility and six is the highest. Why don't we check this out? I'm gonna right click on my SRC, do a new Java class. Let's make a driver. I'm gonna plug in a main method with PSVM. <coughs> okay, how do I call this role method? It's not static. That means I need to actually construct an object. So I'm gonna create a die using the default, the no args constructor. All right, that's gonna make a six-sided boolean. I want to tell that thing to roll. All right, this is producing a number in the range one to six. Wink, wink. Um, I wanna test this, and again, trying to do it kind of statistically. Well, why don't we do just one? I'm gonna right click in free space, tell it to run. Hmm, no, I should probably tell that the print. That was an actual whoopsie. Okay, so I'm gonna put that into an SOP. This is returning an integer. In order for me to see that integer, I need to actually tell it to print. Let's tell it to run now. All right, I got a one that time, okay. If I was to run it again, I get a one. Seem kind of lucky, why don't we bring in our loop to do 30 iterations and um, we'll get a little bit better statistical analysis of this. I'm gonna tell it to run. Um, I would argue that's not correct. Hmm, what's going on here? I'm getting one every single time. Well, IntelliJ has been trying to tell me this entire time, right, with the yellow here. If I scroll over this, math.random cast to int is always rounded down to zero. I'm sorry, what? Okay, we got this expression here, right? Out of this whole expression, what has the highest precedence? This is kind of a hard question because the answer is actually our method selector. So random is going to be the first thing that happens. We're going to actually produce a random number in the range zero to one, inclusive, exclusive. The next highest precedence is then this cast, okay? So what's happening is that this is producing a number in the range 0, 0.0 to 1.0, meaning there is no whole number here, right? We're going to get up to one, but never one itself. There is no whole number. You have zero point something. And what the int does is truncate it, meaning we're gonna discard that fractional part. This is always giving me zero. So we're getting zero, multiplying by our number of sides. Doesn't matter what that is because multiplying zero times anything is gonna give me zero. So up through here, I have zero. And then I add one to that. That's why we're getting one every single time. Okay, you have to be careful with this. These are test questions. I promise you they're gonna to try to get you on this. The only thing that has a higher level of precedence than the method selector is parentheses. So I'm gonna put parentheses around this expression We'll tell it to run. There we go. 
Now we're getting our number range one to technically seven, but I like to express it as one to six the moment that we start casting as integers, right? Inclusive on both ends. There are six possibilities. Really, the way I kind of want to think about this is there are sides possibilities. So this actual expression is doing one to sides. And this example that we got here in our code, that is a six, okay? Um, now, I believe, we're going to double check it here, that this one doesn't actually matter. It doesn't need to be in the expression, right? Because what we're going to do is we're going to random. We'll multiply that by sides. That'll get casted. And then we add one to shift our range. Let's make sure that we're getting the same result. Okay. And so that may be a question that you see, is that the addition here being on the outside doesn't matter too much. Okay. It does matter when it comes to casting, right? That multiplication is in here. We want the multiplication to happen first. Okay. So um, let's test out our other constructor and wrap this thing up, right? My D&D &D people, you know, we can come in with a 20-sided die. Let's test that out. It's going to use the other constructor where we set the sides to exactly 20. And so my die at that point is a 20-sided die, not a six-sided die, meaning there are 20 possibilities whenever we roll this thing. I uh, don't see a 20. I think we're just unlucky. There we go. Okay. Yep. We, oh, we got both. We got both ends of our range here, right? We was expecting one to be our lowest possibility, 20 to be our highest, and we actually see those in our output, right? All this um, method is doing is using sides. So it doesn't matter which constructor we go through. Whenever we tell that object to roll, this will dynamically adjust based on that. And that's kind of cool. All right. This has been um, random, and this has been die. I'll see you in the next one.